Okay. Okay. <laughs> I just, I realized I could not be with Cheech, with the Cheech, and not bring my A-game. So I mean, wow. I'm going to just take a moment to take this in to enjoy the view. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Please do. Hello. <laughs> How are y'all doing? Doing good. I would say that I'm feeling happy to be here, and it has been a very emotionally taxing week. So, yeah, it's just been, like, heavy and... Yeah, I'm excited to be to be talking about liberation, quite frankly, because I yeah. feel like what has come up this week is how necessary it is to have this conversation. Mm. And that that's always the work that I do. And it's always part of the conversation. But I think that there's opportunity on a larger scale because of what has happened this week. Um, to talk about it. So I'm just happy to be in this space and to celebrate Chi Chi for writing a, a book that is already captivating people in a way that is changing who they know themselves to be. So I yeah. just, I'm happy to be here. Beautiful. I want to start with uh, Jessica Denise Dixon. This is a, this is a Stan hour for <laughs> <laughs> And I, because I know it's been such a tough week, I just wanted to say that I appreciate the way you show up in the world mm -hmm. um, and not just because of your brilliance, because everybody will experience that today, mm -hmm. but your choice to be vulnerable and tender and soft with yourself um, and to continue to choose that in the face of all the things that we endure on a regular basis. And I really appreciate that and I admire that about you. And I love the way that you tell the truth about who you are consistently mm -hmm. and over and over and over again. Um, so I appreciate and, and I'm grateful for the fact that you exist in the world in this space oh. and time. I'm glad to share space with you. Oh, oh my gosh. You are gonna make me cry again. You already made me cry this morning. <laughs> so. <laughs> Thank you for wow. taking that in. And it means so much to me. And for me, like, so, so much of my work has been around what does it look like for me to actually be fully human as a Black woman, as a type eight who is a Black woman, um, the intersections of that, the intersections of being someone who is a Black woman who is fat, like, what does it look like in the intersections of who I am to show up fully me? Not to just show up in my power, which is easy. I love mm -hmm. that. Um, but to show up in my strength, which is also softness right. and it's tenderness. Mm -hmm. And it's like, ooh, I can feel my heart and that, uh, I won't swear. Can I swear here? I don't, you're probably not right. Uh, I s go for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question because I probably no. would need to ask that in a few minutes too. <laughs> no censoring needed. I, I'll I'll take the flack for that if there is any flack to take. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but like when my heart is tender and I feel it and I sense it, there is like a fuck yes that I feel like deep in my bones. And I don't ever want to get to a place where I feel like I have to let that go in order mm -hmm. to show up anywhere. I'm committed to being tender, to being vulnerable, and to incorp continue to incorporate that into my sense of strength. Yes. Into my sense of what it means to be a Black woman who is strong as well. So thank you for that um acknowledgement Chi Chi I really appreciate it um I would not be who I am if it were not for you so I'm just happy that we get to share space in the world and that we get to partner and have this conversation and yeah I'm I'm finding myself very very grateful so yeah. well this is already just 
rolling and beautiful and what it needs to be. So I just very briefly will will give us some introduction and then uh, let you two keep on rolling. But <laughs> we jumped um, right in. <laughs> I, I love it. I love it. I can just click my camera off and just and, and just let you go. Um, which I'd be glad to do. So you, you don't, you two don't know me. Like we haven't met before this, but I, just, I do want to say like, it is an honor to meet you and to be any part of, of this uh, conversation. And uh, I've followed both your work for, for quite a while. And I'm just really excited that, that uh, people are going to get to experience even more of that today through the, the narrative channels. And um, for those of you watching, just hello. Thank you so much for being here. I love seeing the, folks keep joining and are already talking to one another and commenting. That's exactly what we want going on. So thank you all for being here. Um, my name is Sarah Due. I'm the social media manager for the Narrative Enneagram. And we are here, as Jessica said, to discuss mm -hmm. Chi Chi's book, The Enneagram for Black Liberation, which you can see on her shelf behind her. Uh, hey. Beautiful display hey. there. Hey. The, the mark of a real author knows to do that in Instagram lives. Um, <laughs> that and so many other things. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, but Chi Chi and Jessica are here to have a conversation about staying soft in a hard world. So um, I will introduce them formally and then we will roll, but uh, we plan to be here for about an hour. I expect we might go a little longer than that, but if you have to jump off at any point, we will uh, save this and share it so you can come back to it. And we'll talk at the end if you'll stay tuned about um, a giveaway. We are gonna give away one free copy of the book um and also an art print so hang out for details can i um, can i say something about the giveaway is that please. even if you win you need to buy this you need to buy the book and give away a copy to someone there you go mm -hmm. i've you. already given away a copy of this and bought a copy of this so i am like same. Very so just to that. jump on yeah. the bandwagon. <laughs> yeah. So don't feel like if you won, like, like, yes, be excited and pay it forward because liberation is always shared. It's not an individual experience. There you go. So anyway. Thank you for, for plugging that. Uh, okay. So bios. So uh, Chi <laughs> Gorham, <laughs> certified Enneagram teacher with the narrative Enneagram, writer and psychotherapist, is a lifelong student of what it means to be fully human. She holds a Master of Arts in Clinical Mental Health Counseling from Denver Seminary and a Postmaster Certificate in Marriage and Family Therapy. Chi Chi is an adjunct faculty member here at the Narrative Enneagram, and she lives in Los Angeles. And this is her first of what I hope will be many published books. And uh, yes, um, and Jessica Denise Dixon is a life, power, life empowerment coach who believes that when Black women heal, the world heals. Believing that the path to personal and collective healing comes through examining the systemic issues that impact each of us and unraveling oppressive systems from our worldviews, Jessica utilizes the inner work of the Enneagram with the context setting of anti-racism to create healing environments for her clients in one-on-one -on -one work, group work, and with organizations. And again, my name is Sarah and all our pronouns are she, her, hers. So with that, uh, with that foundation set, um, Chi Chi, if you'll get us started here, okay. um, a foundational metaphor or the foundational metaphor for the book is this use of the language of armor to describe our Enneagram type structures, which I think is a really helpful image. So I wonder if you could just a little bit about kind of how you arrived at that language or that terminology and um, maybe how you identify the the nine types of armor that that we use sure so I think how I arrived at it was in my own exploration of my type and I remember these conversations still happen but I remember lots of conversations at first when I was learning about the Enneagram, not necessarily within the narrative Enneagram, but just in the general public, like you are your type. But there was something about learning it through the language of the narrative that helped me realize that it was something that I used to navigate the world and had been using my entire life to navigate the world, but it wasn't the entirety of who I was. And that is honestly the thing that felt most freeing to me because 
in any other system I had used, um, like personality typing system, it felt like this is the category. You fit in this box. This is who you are. This is what you do. Um, and this felt like an invitation to be like, oh, if this is something I use, then there's more freedom to explore the I part. Who am I outside of these survival strategies? Who am I outside of these patterns that are automatic and subconscious, right? And so yeah. for me, thinking about it as armor was helpful to create, to start to create space between myself and what I do um, and what I have done. And it allows me to expand the possibility of what else what else is true other than my one story about how I have to be, how the world is, how other people are. And so that's why I use the language of armor um, to describe the nine types or the nine uh, ways of being, uh, because I really see it as, a, you know, something that we can utilize to help us navigate the world, but does not define the full entirety of who we are. And then in particular, with this particular topic, when, when I was thinking about my experience as a Black woman, I was thinking of the multiple layers of armor besides my individual type that mm -hmm. I w walk around the world with. So when I first came to the Enneagram, I thought I was a six um, mm -hmm. because I use that armor regularly. <laughs> I am anticipating, you know, what I, I want to keep myself safe in a world right. that genuinely feels threatening and unsafe. So I'm, right. I'm a few steps ahead thinking about what I need to do to make sure I'm safe, to make sure I'm prepared. Um, and I generally don't trust a lot of people to have my best interest at heart in a, in this system. <laughs> sure. And so, so there's, there, that armor felt and still feels very familiar to me. So I thought that, that that was my primary home base. And then after exploring more, I was like, that's not actually where I, if I think back to the youngest versions of me, it wasn't, those were not my concerns. I was mm -hmm. very much in the fourth space. Um, but that's an extra additional layer of armor. The layer of armor that probably feels most familiar to Jessica, I think is also one that feels familiar to Black women in the US, which is strength, right? I have to be strong. I have to show up as being able to handle anything. I can't show weakness. I can't show vulnerability because you will take advantage of that. Um, that's an additional layer of armor. So I'm just thinking through all of these extra layers that uh, Black women, people who hold marginalized identities hold and how much harder it is to access the self beneath the armor when there are multiple layers of armor. So then what does rest look like for someone like me, for someone like Jessica? What does, um, how do we access ease and softness and pleasure and play when we have like five layers of armor to navigate the world on a regular mm -hmm. basis? So that was, that was part of my, you know, desire to have this conversation in the book. And then you asked about the nine um, forms. So I'll just list them off. Perfect. Okay. Just a quick. So, so for the one, the armor is goodness. The story of uh, needing to to be to use goodness as a way to protect from feeling bad, from uh, losing access to worth and belonging. Uh, for the two, the armor is um, helpfulness, uh, being seen as helpful and generous. For the three, the armor is um, success. And for the four, the armor is exceptionality. For the five, the armor is knowledge. For the six, the armor is um, vigilance. Seven, the armor is optimism. Eight, the armor is strength. And nine, the armor is adaptability. Awesome. Thank you for, for uh, setting the, the table for us there with that. Uh, just a note for the for the audience that I forgot. If you have a question, please ask it. There's a little there's a question button, like a little question mark in a um, uh, we call it not a thought bubble, but a, a quotation. But just click that and ask the question there, because there's no way we're going to keep up with uh, with all of these wonderful comments. So, just a note. Um, okay, so so with with that foundation, understanding what we're talking about with the armor. This is a question. For both of you, Jessica, maybe you want to start because because Chi Chi has um, kind of started to answer it. But what is your armor personally, and and how do you do the work of staying armored? Oh well, this 
is uh, a deep and vast question. Um, and I think that it always is in flux. I would say right now, if we're being honest, my armor has been, everything's fine. I'm good. I'm strong. I got this. I got this. Nope, it's cool. <laughs> so that when we talk about like the defense mechanism of denial for for the types, that's kind of where, where my armor is very strong at the moment. Mm -hmm. Everything will, everything's fine. What do you mean there's a, pro oh no. Nope, I'm good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what's the cost of that? Ooh. That's a good question, Sarah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Being true to myself. Letting myself be seen. On the flip side of letting myself be seen is, is it safe to be seen? Right. And if I'm seen, am I actually in a place where people will see and hold that or where they'll take advantage of it? Right. But the cost of not being fully present to myself and with others is big. Yeah. And there's the added layer of, can, it, can I be? Is it true that I actually can be? Sure. And what is the evidence that says you are safe to fully be. Because if it was there, I might be having a different experience with my armor right now. Yeah. I feel that so deeply, um, especially the what is the evidence, right? That it mm -hmm. is safe for me to be unarmored in this moment, which is, which is a lot of why I wrote this book, because I don't think that it is practical or possible for us to expect that people who are constantly facing the or dealing with the harm of these systems of supremacy that we exist in have the spaces to set down our armor in ways that don't then cause us to be even more harmed you know right um yeah <sighs> yeah just keep breathing so you started us down a road i really want to go down uh so i, I was almost going to flip our order but I'll, I'll i will i will wait and we will come back uh and build on what what she, she just said there but um one of the things that i really appreciate about, appreciate about how you frame this in the book is that you're you're very emphatic that um our armor holds gifts that are important mm -hmm. um and it's not it's not something we should demonize or try to rid ourselves of entirely in fact it's it's really essential it, it has helped us survive in the world you're you're both doing um you're both explaining how that functions right now so but rather the work is to create this space between yeah. who we are and the armor we carry so could you speak to kind of how the enneagram invites us to make and and maintain um that that space i realized that i didn't answer your last question which i think was posed to both of us which is like what's your armor <laughs> yeah you had kind of i just it, got so caught up in say. yeah in jessica's <laughs> response um so i'll answer that and tie that into this awesome. the answer to this question um Right now, I would say my armor looks like privacy as a way to keep myself from being, from not being fully seen. And I was thinking about that when, when Jessica was talking, because I, specifically when you asked the question, what's the cost? I was like, what I actually want is to be seen, but I don't want to have to face or deal with the expectations of other people on how I'm supposed to show up or how I'm supposed to be seen. I don't want to get um, caught up in having to create an image now 
as a as an author, as a as an Enneagram expert, whatever, yes. in order to be seen as competent or capable or that I have something important to say. Um, and so because of that, I'm, I just retreat. I show just a little bit that, you know, allows me to keep, you know, I've made these commitments. I'm going to have these author talks and whatever, but I really am bringing like 15% of myself because mm-hmm. I'm keeping, you know, the, the privacy is a way to keep myself safe from the projections of what people expect me to be and who I'm supposed to show up in the world as. Um, so that's what I've been, that's what I've been noticing recently. Um, somebody said it's giving type four. I am a type four. <laughs> it's giving type four and it's giving self-preservation. Yes. Which is something that I think that even if you're, even if that's not your dominant instinct. It is. People of color. Yeah. We go there with ease because we have to, yeah. because we have to be able to take care of ourselves in a world that is not necessarily caring about taking care of us or ensuring that we are safe. Yeah. So well, I wanted to put that in there. Yeah. <laughs> and, and as soon as you, you started talking about expectations and that kind of triggering the need for the armor, Chichi, it reminded me of like, Jessica, you actually are in the book. We didn't mention that, but there, there are pages with Jessica's words it in the book. <laughs> Um, but you actually say on uh, page 98, like, my armor of strength feels the most necessary when I'm showing up in spaces where I feel like people expect me to be a certain way for them. So this, this call for the armor when there's expectations is, is a, a common theme for, for both of you, even if the motivation is a little different. Yeah. Yes. And I know we'll get to it when we talk about the community piece, but I'll just say now that that's why it's also important to recognize the way like how we show up in community, how we show up collectively can increase the need of the need for armor because we are not holding space or creating space for people to really fully be who they are. And we're asking people to be who we need them to be, who we want them to be, which is not the same as allowing them to free, the freedom to be who they are. Sure. Um, and then to answer your second question, <laughs> um, which could you say it again? <laughs> <laughs> Um, if I can get back to it, but uh, yeah, so just talking about um, the, the, the work is not to rid ourselves of the armor because it, it has this importance, but, but to create that space. So how does the Enneagram invite us to do that or support us in, in making that space? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I think that rather than you know demonizing or what I feel like I witness often is when people come to the Enneagram and learn about their types, it's uncomfortable a little bit because it's like someone reading your diary to the world. And so there might be this sense of, oh, I want to change those things or I want to like distance myself from these parts that I don't like. Um, And I think starting from the place of understanding that this is a survival strategy that has been helpful, that has been beneficial. And for a lot of us still continues to be, still Mm -hmm. continues to be necessary. Um, allows us to show up first with compassion and with grace and then naming that it is something that I utilize. It is something that is a part of how I show up, but is not the entirety of how I show up helps us then create that space. And within that space, we have access to more choice about um, how we want to respond. Um, We have access to more freedom to explore what else is true. That is my favorite question to ask myself in my practice is what else is true? Um, Because Asking it that way does not negate my singular story about who I need to be, right? That story Mm -hmm. has been true in a lot of settings. Um, But what else is true means that other things are possible. While my story might be true, there are other things that I could explore. Um, So I think that the Enneagram helps us, one, by helping us to name what the the pattern is, what the the habits are what the armor is and even just in the naming it right that can create some space that can allow you to the part of you that's going oh there's there's the thing again there's the thing I do that part of you is a little has a little bit of space in order to observe um, the pattern and then the practices of noticing pausing allowing what's there which is the hardest part Mm. allowing what's there to be there (laughs) without (laughs) trying to change it without being critical or judgmental or you know shaming yourself for it 
just going there it is again uh i know renee is on this live and um the, i learned this from her and i think she learned it from one of her teachers but the of course practice when you notice your type in action to go of course of course it's here of course i am feeling of course i'm responding this way because my fear of abandonment was activated Right. Of right. course, as opposed to the shame or the criticism or I should know better or I should be further along in this journey or whatever mm -hmm. you know, the situation might be. Um, and that that creates that allows us to be compassionate with ourselves because you can't really get to wherever you think you're supposed to be until you've accepted where you are right. and allowed yourself to be here. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, I don't know if I answered the question I went. I went somewhere. No, that's perfect. I loved it. Ditto. That, yeah, that, what else is true? That question is just so helpful. Um, and I had forgotten the, of course, practice. So thank you for uh, reminding us of that. Uh, so I have a, a, a question um, building on that or, or in response to that for both of you. Uh, so who are you without that armor, uh, without your armor? And what, what practices help you remember um, and, and return to, to your fullest, softest self? <laughs> I, um, I read about this in the book, but when I, the easiest way for me to access who I am, and I'm still learning who I am without my armor, but the easiest way for me to access the body experience of that is um, one of my earliest memories of myself as a three-year-old, um, which a funny story. So in, in the book, I write about my, myself as a three-year-old, and this is truly the earliest memory I have of being outside of church on a Sunday. And it was a circle of adults who were laughing at something I was saying or something I was doing. And then somebody picked me up and threw me in the air multiple times. And I felt like I was flying and I felt so like happy and seen and free. Um, which, so the funny story is I wrote that in the book because it, it's my, my body memory that came back to me. But then I was talking to my mom about it and she was like, oh yeah, people would leave work early we had service on sundays and thursdays so that people would leave work early grown adults to get to the church <laughs> uh before the service was to start because i was a pastor's kid so i was always there um to get to church before the service was supposed to start because they wanted to come hang out with me because i was so funny and they just <laughs> enjoyed being around me i was like this validates everything i know to be true about my <laughs> actual truest self <laughs> <laughs> that like I life happened pain happened and I retracted into myself and but when I when I am when I feel the most like myself it is a light-hearted um access to joy access to play uh the ability to be present with pleasure the ability to allow myself to be seen and cared for without this feeling of like, I have to do something, I have to do something to earn that or I have to do something to maintain that. Mm -hmm. Like just that feeling of like, I'm just being. And of course, when I think back to that memory, how, how it feels in my body is, of course you love being around me, of course. <laughs> like, there's no question of, oh, what is it that, you know, what is it that they enjoy so I can make sure I keep doing it or I can make sure that I don't, um, jeopardize our connection <clears throat> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so for me that's like that's how I I know that I'm accessing my fuller softer self um so some practices that help with that um one I think just really trying to surround myself with people who allow space for that um with my dearest friends I know that I have more access to this part of myself because I am that lighthearted. They think I'm crazy because I actually am. I mean, crazy isn't, <laughs> you know, hilarious, not. <laughs> but like, I, <laughs> um, I, I allow myself <laughs> to be just whoever I am in that moment without holding on to this idea of who the authentic Chi Chi should be in order to have love. Yeah. Mm. 
I love your early memory. My earliest memory <laughs> is of me at Disney World with my family, probably around two or three. And we were just like sitting out in Epcot. I remember like being in a stroller and just being happy, just being so joyful. And I, I would say that for me, like the, the most authentic self is like the Jessica who skips and jumps and I scream when I am excited about something and I can't <laughs> even help it. And I'm just like ridiculous and loud and I have a boisterous laugh. And when I'm just tapped in to joy, uh -huh. that feels like this true picture of, of me, this true this true sense of me and it's interesting because sometimes when people meet me they will guess that i'm a seven because i do have a big laugh and i have these dimples and you know i can be very joyous i'm like wait until i'm triggered <laughs> you don't know me when, <laughs> you don't know me you know it's like hulk like you, know, you won't like me when i'm triggered like you when i'm triggered i go to my type eight defense so easily but Man, when I'm not, and I just like get really excited and talk really fast and like giggle and skip and jump and clap. <laughs> I'm really happy. I just like clap a lot. <laughs> it feels like this like young part who mm -hmm. felt like she had to just grow up way too fast, yeah. who felt like there wasn't anyone who was going to protect her. So she needed to give up those parts of her mm -hmm. and I come back to her often and I've had to do intentional actual work to get to her again I've done a lot of like inner child work if I need to I'll go get on some swings and just like have fun you know with like little kids b beside me and like you know it's just the things that I have to do like it's real work to stay in touch with my heart and the innocence that is present within me. But when I don't, I, I know that I don't, I don't feel whole. Like I lose a part of myself that I like to be in touch with. For me, it's much more about like who I get to experience myself as. And then everyone, like you said, Gigi, of course, like, of course you wanna be around me. Of course, of course you love me. Of course, you know, you're happy that I'm here laughing at your jokes. Um, I love this new, of course, practice. <laughs> yeah. I, like the old, I love the old one, but I'm just really loving this new one, right? Of course you want to be around me. Of course you love me. I'm going to practice that more on a regular basis. Me too. I like it a lot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I will say, of course, you're both delightful to be around <laughs> in this form. I can only imagine um, swinging and, and prancing and being so, yeah. And yeah, of course, of course. Um, I... I love the the um, referencing like actually like, physically going to swings or like like mm -hmm. childhood things like that, which is very relatable to me. I have rediscovered my love of like trampolines and gymnastics and flipping as an adult, which has been a like a really important body practice. But this gives me an opportunity, or maybe I'm creating it, but I've been looking for it. Um, I just I have to ask <laughs> Chi Chi um, how the roller skating is going. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, one of the most relatable things you have posted, which you've posted a lot of relatable things, but, but you posted this picture of roller skates and you said, I'm so serious about prioritizing play and fun this year. And as a fellow four who has said in a staff meeting, I'm working really hard on having more fun. Um, I just, it's relatable, but how's the skating going? <laughs> I'm trying to be less serious about having fun. <laughs> so that's how it's going, first of all. Um, yes. And it's going all right. I'm not like, <laughs> I was about to say, I'm not as committed to the practice as I would like to be. Um, but I need to, there are a couple things I need to fix with my roller skates and then I'll get back into. But even just the the few times I've done it, it's felt so like, you know, the freedom, the permission to just do something new and be bad at it and yeah. not feel like you have to immediately be good. But then there's also a part of me that's like, Wait, how people long do I that? What do you mean? Listen, I'm trying. It's part <laughs> of my practice. 
I'm, I'm also like, how long is it going to take until I'm good at this? Like, how long until right. I can go to an actual rink and, you know, have fun? But, uh, <laughs> but I, I, it also, speaking of body practices, um, I have a lot of grief around, um, like Jessica said, having to grow up so fast that there are so many, there are so many missed experiences for me in childhood, more along the lines of fun and ease and like the freedom to play. I was, you know, catapulted into seriousness and maturity really quick. Um, so when I'm on those roller skates and I'm like falling, <laughs> I, I try to think about like, this, this is where you would have started at six, at eight, mm -hmm. at nine. This is where you're supposed to start. Um, and like, how can we make this fun? So I play my favorite music, skate around my apartment, fall a few times, you know, it's a good practice. But things like that, my, my other favorite way of being in my body is salsa dancing. Um, nothing makes me happier, truly nothing makes me happier. But also, I get to turn off my brain, which I think is the magic of it. I get to turn off the part of me that's like constantly either thinking or observing how other people are responding to me and literally just being in my body and letting, you're a better dancer if you're really, to me, if you're not thinking, if you're just in your body and allowing yourself to be in the present moment. And that's another way that like helps me come back to you and I'm like all right all this joy was here this whole time I was just stuck <laughs> I was stuck yeah. somewhere else but look if I if I pay attention the joy is right here can I can I add something to what you're saying because when you talked about like getting the skates and like if I start at six or eight like I would fall I would do all uh -huh. these things it's such an amazing opportunity for us to be with our younger selves yes. and to like hold our younger selves and be like <clears throat> You would have been falling and you would have had fun and you wouldn't have made it mean anything about you. Right. And you get to do that as an adult. Mm -hmm. You get to fall and you don't have to make it mean anything about you. Mm -hmm. You get to try something and you get to fail and you don't have to make it mean anything about you. Mm -hmm. You get to accept that these things are part of the process of learning and growing. And at some point, most of us snapped out of that. Yep. At some point, most of us, we, we were young and whatever happened in our lives, we're like, oh, <laughs> nope, can't mess up, can't fail, can't put mm -hmm. myself out there, can't do whatever the thing is for us. Yeah. But when we have the opportunity, like you do with your roller skates, to be your six-year-old self, yeah. then you get to hold your six-year-old self and be like, hey, baby girl, you didn't have not have the the space to yeah. do this at that age, but I'm giving it to you now. Yes. And and our current selves get to hold those younger selves yep. and give the things that we wish that we had then. And that to me is beautiful. Yes. Really, really beautiful work. You don't have to make it mean anything about you. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna I'm taking that with me because I just had like this warm wash of like that sounds amazing and also my foreness like does not compute does not compute yeah <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to make it mean anything that's that's so good I I will work with that thank you yeah oh okay so um I have uh I have a, a, another question or a, a a prompt for for going forward so so two, two of my favorite sections in the book um, are the, uh, when you write about the collective approach to wholeness work and power and vulnerability. So I wonder if we can talk a bit about why our, our growth and healing can't happen separate from the collective. Um, and specifically, Chi Chi, I think your differentiation about what growth work is for um centered people versus people who hold marginalized identities um is really important mm -hmm. um and i i'd love to hear whatever you might want to say about that today you uh talk about your insights you had during training which i think are really important and have been really um impactful for our faculty i know so um 
so that was a lot of work. So to talk about the, the personal uh, work and, and growth as, uh, as collective work and this differentiation of what the work is for people mm -hmm. who hold marginalized identities mm -hmm. versus folks who've been centered. Yeah, I think, you know, um, we all kind of got very excited about these conversations about vulnerability that have been in the mainstream, which is amazing for the last few years. But what I was noticing, which I read about in the book, in the trainings was that these conversations around like healing and growth and wellness seems to um, state that you're, you will know that you are growing and you're healing if you are living an unarmored, undefended life. And I just kept feeling like, yeah, that works for some people, but that don't work for me. <laughs> um, <Right. laughs> for the people who have access to um, more power and privilege and who are centered in our society, it is possible to uh, set down your armor more frequently because the systems exist to protect you. Right. Um, for me, I did not feel like that was true to my lived experience, which then begs the question of how then, what is my healing? What does that look like? What's my work if it's not the same um, as those with the, those who are centered and those who have access to power and privilege. And so I think that um, the primary thing that I focus on when I'm talking about how this relates to black women, to people who hold marginalized identities is for us to recognize one, that the armor is still necessary um, and that utilizing your armor does not mean that you are not growing, does not mean that you are not well, it does not mean that you are not healthy. This is not a conversation about health versus unhealth. Um, and the two, creating space between, like we've been talking about, between myself and the armor gives me the freedom to choose when to put it up and when to set it down. And the setting it down piece, um, both are important, but the setting it down piece, I think, is really, really helpful for me. If I, if I just make think about this as my, from my experience as a Black woman, is that if I am not creating space between me and this armor that I use, I will continue to confuse my survival strategies with who I am, which means I don't have the choice to set down that armor when there is care being offered, when yeah. there is love and support being offered because I'm just so my body is an automatic defended armored mode constantly so I think the work is to create that space so that I can use my intuition to discern whether or not this is a safe space if it's not my armor goes up without shame if it yeah. is I can practice setting it down so that I can access the the care I can actually receive the care and the tending and the support that might be present for me um, and in doing so, continue to return to who I am beyond the armor. Can we just pause? And I just want to say, you're fucking amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Like, I just like, can't get enough of you. And, Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to receive that. I just needed to say that. Thank you. <laughs> yes, and cosine. <laughs> yeah. And your armor goes up without shame. Yes. Is, is key without shame. Because there's so many spaces for us that are still unsafe. So it doesn't actually, it's not an invitation into wellness to tell me that I need to enter those spaces with my armor down without first talking to the other people in those spaces to have oh. them perhaps put their uh, weapons down. Oh. <laughs> you know? <laughs> A conversation that could be had. <laughs> Yeah, and, and you're just, you're so clear in the book, which I just uh, appreciate the, the directness. And, and so I'll, I can, I'll punctuate with your own words here, but you say it's extremely privileged to define the healthy life as one without armor. And it's harmful to make unarmored vulnerability the end goal without addressing the systemic inequities that make armoring necessary for groups of people. Mm -hmm. Which is why, and I've, I've absolutely like love that vulnerability is such a, you know, it's an important topic, you know, Brene Brown, the Caucasian like self-help goddess has written books about it, you know, and it's great. It's really, really great. But there is something that there is, there is another step that 
Brene cannot get us to just because of her privilege and power. Sure. And that is, you know, I just think about all of the people who were forced to read The Power of Vulnerability or one of the other books and everyone like, yes, we're all going to be vulnerable. And in collective settings, Black women are punished for vulnerability. Black women are ostracized, fired, sanctioned. So what does it mean to actually be vulnerable? Mm -hmm. And we cannot look at what it means to actually have a lived experience of vulnerability not just an intellectual understanding of what vulnerability is, but a lived experience of what vulnerability is without looking at those dynamics. It cannot happen. Mm -hmm. We cannot truly be safe. I think of all the people of color who are like, okay, but like, are you gonna stop doing the microaggressions? Right. Like, Oh, are you going to hold my words against me and take them to HR and make me out to be the big, bad black uh -huh. woman? What's actually going to happen uh -huh. in these situations now that vulnerability is the way? Right. And what are you responsible for? Like, what is the centered person, that organization? Because a lot of it is putting the impetus for vulnerability and change on the people who are being harmed right exactly. without talking yeah. about what's your responsibility what are you how are you going to show up differently in a way that can foster a space that feels safe enough for me to put down my armor as opposed right. to just requiring me to show up with my armor down meanwhile you've done nothing to shift or change right yeah and so that's why i say that armoring up without shame and moving away from that language of like the armor um living a, an armored life is somehow detrimental to wellness and growth i think confusing our identity with our armor is detrimental yes to our freedom to our healing to our growth but the armor is absolutely necessary in many spaces and our work is to be able to distinguish between this is the thing i use but this is not the entirety of who i am yeah and i think you know the conversation about like armor it's like i do a lot of work with you know the enneagram and into racism and, and embodiment so a lot of work around our nervous system mm -hmm. and it's not bad for our body to go into a fight or flight response. That's actually not a bad thing. That means our nervous system is doing what it knows to do to protect us. Mm -hmm. Now, do we need protecting? The work that I do with white folks is often like, okay, your nervous system is, is all tripped up. Why? Mm. Is it because you're like losing privilege right now or you fear losing privilege or is it because like whiteness is being challenged and you've been conditioned and taught and it's been so embodied that conflict is an actual threat to your sense of self that you feel actually unsafe when you're just actually uncomfortable and you don't understand yeah. the difference between those things right and so this conversation lives not just like in our hearts and in our heads, but in our bodies. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in order for Black liberation to happen, you know, we, we do have, you know, we have our own work of like being free and separating our armor and um, white people need to do actively, actively do the work of dismantling internalized advantage that mm -hmm. in internalized entitlement that centering that she's talking about from not just their thought process but from the nervous system yeah and that is what creates actually a world in which we can flourish when my body is not seen as a threat when mm -hmm. someone can say oh my nervous system is having a fight response right now when a white person can say that and then they can actually do the work to be like, what conditioning is this from? Because mm -hmm. I'm not saying this person is not actually a threat. Right. And so this work is our Enneagram work because our Enneagram armoring is the thing that comes up to protect us. Yeah. Oh, and that's why it's so important. Yeah, I'll just, I'll pull out that distinguishing between unsafe and uncomfortable for other white folks who are listening like that is so much of the work um 
So hear that, um, please. Um, so in light of this reality that we're describing, that we're talking about, um, how does Black sisterhood and community help, uh, help you nurture and protect that softest self under the armor? And as you pause to answer that, I'll just, I'll let uh, the rest of you know that uh, we'll move to Q&A after this. So if you have questions uh, that you wanna ask, please tap that question mark and, and ask them and we'll, we'll get to them soon. The first thing that comes to my mind is the experience of being witnessed by a black woman. Ooh. Particularly though, I'm in contrast to being witnessed in a certain way by someone who isn't black, who witnesses you and then says something like, You're so brave or you're so strong, mm -hmm. or I'm so impressed by you, or whatever, you know? It's just, it, um, that's, that's not how I am witnessed by Black women. I feel like there is a freedom there, and a shared, even if our experiences could be vastly different, a shared understanding um, that allows me to be myself and be witnessed in ways that feel affirming to the fullness of my humanity, not just the way somebody is conditioned to see me. Or maybe the ways that they're conditioned to respond to me, right? Like I have, this is a tiny soapbox that may or may not be related, but I really have a hard time with um, the idea of resilience or being called resilient, which who gets called resilient most often? And to me, my experience of it and my, my annoyance with it is that it's often been used as a way to not name, not take responsibility for the situations, the systems that require me to show up in a certain way, but just applaud that I can show up in that way. Yeah. And it's almost like there is no, sometimes it feels like there's no space for me to be the other parts of myself that are not resilient. The angry, the petulant, the soft, the hurt, the whatever. Yeah. And so within, within being witnessed by Black uh, women, I am free to do that. Yeah. You know, I'm free to, I, I'm thinking about the call that we had where I collected some of the stories from the book and I just felt like, I, I told everybody on that call that it would last, I think, an hour and a half. And I don't know how long we were on Zoom. We were on, for a, long <laughs> we were on Zoom for a long time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was like, I want to respect your time. But also, this, you know, um, but just that feeling of being able to say the thing, to be exactly how you are, and for someone to say, yes, me too, you know, without going into the but you're so strong to have endured this. I don't want to endure it, right? This also brings up for me the mm -hmm. conversations between like a co-conspirator co versus an ally, and yeah. we don't have to get into that. But just that feeling of like, this person is with me, um, that I don't have to translate my spirit in order to be seen, understood, held. Yeah. Chi-Chi, I had the exact same thought. Like you took the words out of my mouth about just being seen by Black women. There's nothing like it. It's just like not having to explain myself, not having to like, I mean, just not having to explain myself, like period at the end of the sentence is like an amazing thing. Not having to explain like the societal dynamics or how exhausting it is to have to show up in certain spaces. Like black women who see me that there's just a, a shared sense of, I, I get you, I get you and we're in it together. And one thing I want to say, Chichi, that I think that you are speaking to in some ways is the ways that other people can give us like validation. I talk <laughs> about validation versus affirmation. And often we want our Enneagram type really likes being validated. Yep. Look mm -hmm. how strong I am. Look how exceptional this type four is. <laughs> Look how, and it's like when people call me strong, I'm like, huh, thanks. 
you don't actually see me. <laughs> exactly. You yeah. don't see like the tenderness behind. You don't see like the it's taking me everything to keep my heart open in this world in which it is constantly attacked. And when I'm with black women, when I'm in community, I am affirmed for the fullness and richness, the, the depth and the breadth of who I am. And without having to explain, without having to show up in a specific way, I can just like let everything out. And it is beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful. And it, there's not, there's really not another experience like it. Mm -hmm. Because my soul is on is is open and it's here and it's being seen. Mm -hmm. And it's just it's the best. It is. I was thinking recently too about this and how I spent a lot of my time in prior to moving to California in a lot of predominantly white spaces, uh, religious spaces, just the city I was in, Denver. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and in many ways, I felt like I was constantly standing out. This is why to me that part of like the, I do want to be exceptional in some ways but I have stood out for so long in so many spaces that it is so unattractive to me. It's so unappealing to me. I'm just like, I don't, if it's not that I'm the only black person in the room, it's going to be, Oh my God, Chi Chi, that's such an interesting name. Where are you from? I'm like, you didn't ask Sarah that question. Right. Leave me alone. <laughs> um, so there's mm -hmm. so many of those experiences for me. And then since moving here, something that has struck me is that the things that I thought were just particular to me and my experience of the world, because I felt so alone in those experiences because my community was not reflective of my lived reality. In building different relationships, I'm like, I am so normal. My experiences are just like, you know, it's like in the best, I mean, I shouldn't say the best way because some of them are hard experiences and I hate that we all have them. But in a way that frees me from that story of um, it's just you. Because it was just me in a lot of those ways. So I think to answer the question of what it brings, I th that's part of it. That's been part of it for me is getting to have my experiences, both the, the beauty of it and the pain of it mirrored in a way that helps me feel less alone. And where, like Jessica was saying, I don't have to explain. I don't, or I don't have to withhold also because yeah. I'm just like, you're not going to understand. So I'm not even bringing up the conversation, right? Yeah. And I think too, like the individualism that is part of, you know, white culture and the construct of whiteness makes us, it pits black women against one another uh -huh. mm -hmm. because there's not space for all of us in that either or, you know, the binary, you know, way of that whiteness upholds things. And so often we, n not wanting to, tend to be at odds with one another. And then when we can actually be together, come together in community, in a collective sense, and just be seen and known, knowing that we're not in competition because white, the white gaze is not present, it changes the game. Uh -huh. And it makes a difference. It, it matters to have that space where the white gaze is not present, where we're not thinking about it, where we set it down, where it's not impacting how we are and we just get to be real. It's sacred yeah. space. Mm. It feels like an exhale. Yeah. Thank y'all for that. Um, a couple thoughts. We'll be here all day if I keep reading from the book, so I'm not going to do it. But um, <laughs> but that that reminds me that the, what you were just talking about, Jessica, reminds me of um, again the distinctions that that Chi Chi makes in the book between the kinds of power and mm -hmm. the the very white definition of power over and and how mm -hmm. predominant that is. But this alternative, this power within, and then this power with. Mm -hmm. um, is I, I feel like what you were illustrating there um mm -hmm. and this resilience word like 
feels almost like the word unprecedented has felt for the last couple of, it's like, <laughs> and, and I saw somewhere the other day, and I'm not going to remember who said it, but it was like, can we stop praising people for being resilient and figure out how to make a world where people don't have to be so fucking resilient? Like, right. can we, can we move on to that? Um, so, and I don't even know if people know what real resilience is like walking around traumatized all the time but surviving is not the same as being resilient and mm -hmm. i don't even know if people know what it really means so mm -hmm. probably should just get a better definition of it before we continue to use it just just yes. as a side note <laughs> mm -hmm. and you mentioning survival reminded me too that i think with the armor and with our types they are helpful for us in the pursuit of survival not necessarily in the pursuit of our full thriving. Yeah. Mm, yeah. And that's where that, you know, the space and the, the freedom and the choice to, to put up and down can support our full thriving. Um, but if we are just living through the lens of this one singular story of I have to be strong to be okay, I have to be exceptional to be okay, um, it can help you survive. Absolutely, it has helped me survive, but it does not support my full thriving if that is the only story that I live by. Right. Yeah. So important. Yep. Okay, let's try to uh, take a few questions here. So uh, folks, if you haven't put them in yet, um, please tap that question mark and do it. Um, we, have, uh, we have a question for Chi Chi. What are you most proud of in writing this book? What am I most proud of? I am most proud of the fact that I started a thing. Well, first of all, that I said yes. Um, my armor shows up with things like this very quickly to tell me, oh, you're not prepared enough. Mm -hmm. um, you haven't done enough work. You're not ready enough. You're not the right person. So I am proud of the fact that I said yes, even though I was scared. And I'm proud of the fact that I did it, like I finished it. I completed the thing. It is out there in the world now. Um, I'm also proud of the fact that uh, it's so far, even though it's been out for, I mean, technically for just two days, even though pre-orders got sent out early, um, I'm proud of the fact that there have been Black women who've reached out to me and feel seen by this work already. Somebody emailed me uh, yesterday and said that she's reading it with her daughter, and I just, mm. <laughs> I was like, uh. I wasn't even thinking about that as a possibility, and now I just feel really tender about that. So that's, that's, that's what I feel most proud of. Beautiful. Okay, got another one. How do you envision this book being used in marginalized communities? Um, I'll answer that I would love to hear if Jessica uh, has thoughts too. Um, I would just love to see more conversations around us being able to name our survival strategies, name our armor as separate from who we are. There's so many parts of it that are beneficial and helpful. And like I've said, you know, multiple times during this last hour, um, in order to, for us to access the ease and the rest and the freedom, we have to be able to create space. So one, I would love for those conversations around armoring to be more common for us to not just kind of accept, well, that's just, that's just who I am, or that's just who that person is, or that's just, you know, this is just what we do, but to be curious with compassion and grace, but be curious about these, these um, patterns. And then also for us to be able to collectively take ownership of co-creating spaces where we are not requiring other people to live by our own singular stories. Mm. Cause that's the, <clears throat> that's the portion of the collective work, you know, where it's like, if I think that my way of being, my way of seeing the world is the right way, is the only way I am subconsciously holding everybody else to my story by doing so. Yeah. I'm not allowing them to be free and I'm not allowing myself to be free. So we do that in, in community with each other where 
it perpetuates this need for armor because we're holding each other to these one-sided stories and then causing harm in that way. So I want, I want the conversation too to include that, um, which is why at the end of each of the type chapters, there's a portion around uh, our collective work um, in recognizing how my armor can turn into a weapon for you. If I'm holding that up and saying, well, a connection with Jessica is not meaningful to me unless she can prove to me that she's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not very interesting, so. Same, actually. Stop. Pretty, pretty boring, pretty mundane. <laughs> In reality. <laughs> Shinier than it looks. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Yeah, I... I don't know if even I have anything to add because I think that that's the work is for, because when we see the ways that who we've shown up as um, are part of our armor or ways that we armor, we get to really see ourselves with much more depth. And that is something that I think that people who have, you know, privileged identities have found ways to strip from people of color. And so when we can see ourselves in the fullness of who we are, then we show up in a way that is uh, much more about thriving than it is just surviving, which I think is an important, I, when I'm teaching the Enneagram, I teach it the same way. I teach like, hey, this is how you have survived. And that's a beautiful thing. Please do not judge yourself for the ways that you have survived. Um, But can you get curious? I I borrow from the Bible and I say curiosity triumphs over judgment. And there is something really beautiful about getting curious about ourselves and curious about our experience and being able to say like, oh, okay, this was something that I got from my great grandmother whose parents were enslaved. And they pass that down and it's now Mm -hmm. passed down to me and my lineage. Mm -hmm. And now maybe that level of armoring and protection, I can let go. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's so much, not just for our individual, but for the collective that I think is available for us just by exploring our armor, exploring the ways that we have survived and the ways that we survive now. All of the different layers of armor that we have are all telling a story that's very rich and beautiful and detailed. Uh You know, I think of like um, mosaics and some of the intricate details of a mosaic, you know, when you walk up to it and it looks different than far away and you get to see a lot more of of the nuance and the delicate details that are present. And I think that that is who we are especially as as people of color and that's been intentionally stripped from us systemically and so we have such an opportunity to reclaim that for ourselves Mm -hmm. in a way that um is healing and um heals our ancestral lineage you know and um passes on a different legacy for those who will come after us Mm -hmm. I also want to say that one of the things I hope, and this is not, I mean, in general, I think the Enneagram helps us do this. But for me, I feel like knowing somebody's armor allows me to, for example, knowing that Jessica's armor is strength and knowing that it's been a week. Mm. I wanted to start the conversation by affirming your softness, because I know Mm. that when it's been a week, what tends to happen, the armor comes back up. And rather than being like, oh, you're so strong for making it through this week, I wanted to affirm the softness and the vulnerability and the tenderness that you still have amidst all of that, right? So I feel like that's one of the gifts the Enneagram gives us is rather than reinforcing the story of the armor, now that I know, I can speak to something else and and help create, you know, more support for that other soft self. Yeah, like a deeper truth of the soul Mm -hmm. is what you're really speaking to, you know, like what's on the outside and the armor and the way that we present, like, sure, you could talk about that, but there's a deeper, a deeper soul truth 
that you're Thank speaking you. to. That is so beautiful. Yeah. That's so good. That value in knowing each other's armor. Uh -huh. um, so important. Another part of the collective work. Uh -huh. Okay, we've got this question, and this is last call for questions. So if anybody else has them, get them in there now. Um, uh, but we have this question, who are your Black women writer heroes? Ooh, that's a great question. And that can go to both of you, of course. Mm -hmm. <sighs> I love the work of Bell Hooks. Um, I love, and there, I know there are many other things that she has written, but this is her first like book. Um, Ashley C. Ford's memoir, Somebody's Daughter. I have not stopped thinking about it since I read last year. <laughs> um, could talk about it for the next hour. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a person and a piece of work that I really admire. Um, do you have answers? I'm, I'm still thinking about who I would put in this category. I honestly always have trouble remembering what books I've read. <laughs> <laughs> but I love Belle. I love Audre Lorde. Um, Audre Lorde. It's just, uh, those are two that came to mind that have impacted me in major ways. Uh -huh. Major, major. Beautiful. Mm. What I got for now. <laughs> awesome. Okay. So uh, we're coming, we're coming to the end of our, end of, end of our time here. Sorry, I'm trying to get these questions out of the way so I can see your faces. There we go. Um, so this has been everything that I knew it could be and more. Um, so thank you both for, for this time. Let's, let's wrap uh, reminding people where they can get the book and how to participate in this giveaway and then uh, make some invitations if people want to, to learn more from, uh, from the narrative or from either of you. So um, giveaway details. First, so we are giving away one free copy of Chi Chi's book. Again, this is what it looks like. And I have to just say, it is, um, when I opened it, you know, I have like a, I have very particular aesthetic taste in books, right? There's, there's a whole like experience, there's a whole check box, checklist of, of boxes. So it looks beautiful, like visually, it feels beautiful, like the texture, it smells great. <laughs> and the the uh, the inside is laid out beautifully as well, and of course the content is brilliant. You know that by now. So it I was like, oh, it might actually be perfect. Like it might <laughs> it might actually be. And there's even like gold leaf uh, imprints of the uh, of the enneagram symbol down here. So anyway, it is wonderful. Like Jessica <laughs> said, um, buy it. Um, also, if you want to uh, possibly win a free copy. Um, we're going to save and post this video when we're done. So, you know, like it, of course. Um, but then make sure these are the, the two main things. Make sure you follow the narrative Enneagram, the Enneagram for Black Liberation, and Jessica D. Dixon Coaching. And, um, and then comment with one way uh, that you are going to stay soft this week. And if you want an extra entry, comment and tag a friend who you think needs to see this uh, and, and listen to this conversation. And I will, I will write that, of course, so uh, you can come back and reference that. But follow, comment is how you're going to stay soft, tag a friend um, if you can. And I'm going to throw in this art print with the book. That'll come with the book. This is an art print that uh, it's a painting that, that I did and have called soft. And when I posted it months ago, I said just a little something soft and a big hard world. And when Chi Chi reached out with the topic, it was like, how cool. I'm just going to throw that in. So you'll get a book and an art print. Um, and we'll announce the winner Tuesday afternoon. So you have from now till Tuesday afternoon to get in on that. Um, and just a couple of things coming up. Chi Chi, like we said, is actually uh, adjunct uh, faculty now with the Narrative Enneagram. And so if you're ready to like dive in and do some deep uh, Enneagram training, Chi Chi will be teaching with Christopher T. Copeland, another faculty member. Oh, my uh, fave. Right? Oh, Shout out to Chris. Hey. <laughs> yep. 
You're a fave, Chris. Listen, you, you hear that? <laughs> um, <laughs> so they'll be teaching our Enneagram intensive part one. So that's like step one for narrative training. Uh, great program. And, and the two of them will be teaching. And that's weekly uh, from June 22nd to July 27th. And the link to that is in our bio. That's coming up. There's a free Q&A if you're just like, what the heck is the narrative Enneagram? And you want to know more. Uh, on April 7th, also linked in our bio. Um, and we actually have a half day introduction if you're like, I think I'm ready, but like maybe not a whole weekend or a whole month. Um, on April 30th, Renee, who's here, shout out to Renee, and again, Chris the Renee. Fave, uh, will be uh, teaching uh, that with Renee as well. But Chichi, you've got something coming up that, um, that you should plug. Yes, I do. So this is not live yet. So you are Woo! amongst the first. So get on it if you're interested. Um, I am hoping to launch a space for Black women and femmes to practice um, what we're talking about, to practice naming our armor, who we are outside of our armor, and the uncomfortable feelings that can arise when we start making this space between self and armor and trying to set that down, uh, can bring up anger, it can bring up grief, it can bring up fear. So having a, a container um, for that is my hope and my goal. And it's only gonna be for 12 people. Um, I want it to feel intimate and like um, we're really able to support each other. Um, I'll run many of them, but the first one is going to be just 12 12 folks. So if that's something that you're interested in, you can email me at hello at chichiogoram.com and I will add your name to the growing list of people who will get the link first before it's live for everybody else. So. Yay. Awesome. Jessica, what do you want people to know about what you have going on? Hmm. What do I want people to know? That's a really good question. You're running a lot of, of <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of things. <laughs> There's life on vulnerability. There's the new cohort that's just yeah. for melanated folks. Yeah, the reclamation. Mm -hmm. Stop by my Insta. That's <laughs> probably the best way. DM me if you have questions. If you want to do one-on-one -on -one work, um, I have a 12-week intensive that is life-changing. And um, yeah, I'm always just expanding and figuring out what it means to be an entrepreneur. So uh, right. That's like a thing. So, like and follow, um, and we'll just like see what what arises. Uh -huh. If there's something that you want to let me know, you know, my the, I I really work always at the intersections of our enneagram type, giving us our inner context, anti-racism, giving us the out the the outer context of how we live, and then embodiment. Like what is how is our nervous system conditioned by the sensitivities of how our Enneagram type has helped, helped us to survive, as well as the ways that having privilege or a centered identity or having a marginalized or historically um, and systemically oppressed identity has shaped our nervous system as well. And so it's deep work. Um, and I know it's, it's literally not for everyone, but if it's for you, I, I invite you. I invite you to join because it is a step in creating a new world and changing the collective nervous system to make it more a place where, you know, Black men are not seen as threats, that Black women can be passionate without being called angry, that we don't have to mold ourselves to show up in a specific way in order to feel like we are safe. So I want my armor to be down. I don't wanna have to always have it up. Um, and the way that we do that is absolutely collective. I'm based in San Diego, California, on Kumea land. Yeah, so yeah. Thank you. Somebody asked about Chi Chi's email, if we could put it in the chat. It was hello at chichiagoram.com, right? Chi -chi. Yes. Okay, then I, I type that it is that answer is in the chat. Um, okay, I can't believe that we did this and we're still under an hour and 20. Uh, and all the territory that we've covered um, <laughs> is just 
we just went right to it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I said breathtaking, breath giving, you know, like, uh, I, I, I think that's more, uh, more accurate. Chi-Chi, if you want the last word, it's yours. And if that's just too much pressure, we can just, you know, wave and, and be, uh, and part ways. But if you want it, it's yours. <laughs> well, I just want to say thank you to Jessica for joining me for this conversation. It was, a breath of fresh. It was an exhale to be in conversation with you. Thank you, Sarah, for holding space and for the good questions. Thank you to everybody who joined. Um, yeah, and I hope that we all continue to stay soft and stay open. Beautiful. Okay, I hope. What happened? Maybe that's it. I guess <laughs> we're done. <laughs> oh, she's back. Oh, <laughs> I didn't lose y'all. Did you lose me? Yes, you just turned into a frozen circle, so. Okay, well, I'm glad we're back. Um, thank you both for your time. I hope we can talk again uh, sometime. Yeah, I would love that. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.